Hey everyone, welcome to episode four of the Bulldog Alley podcast. It is Monday, May 23rd as we record this. I am your co-host Cole Forsman, joined as always by Asher Ali. Oh, what's up? How you doing today, Asher? <laughs> I'm living, man. Summer's in the air. Uh, we're out here, you know, not going to class every day. Uh, more time for sports, more time for leisure. Um, even though I'm like, you know, we're still, we're both still busy guys, but, um, but no, man, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying the summer right now. How about you? I'm glad you're enjoying the summer because, uh, I looked out my window just now and it's cloudy and I think there's raindrops. So, but no, for the most part, Spokane has been getting towards summer. It just likes to have these random two or three days where, uh, feels like it's fall again, but yeah. <laughs> But along the same lines, just watching a lot of sports. Um, and thankfully, there was a lot of Gonzaga sports happening this week. Um, from baseball, had four games. Uh, there was the NBA draft combine, which had four Zags participating in it. Um, so, yeah, very big week uh, heading into June. Um, and so we can just kind of get right into it. Mm -hmm. Kick this off with baseball. Uh, before their big series against USD, uh, the Zags baseball team had a one game uh, on last Tuesday, I believe, against Oregon. Uh, they did lose in walk-off fashion, 5-4. to four. Um, GU started Bradley Mullen, which was his first appearance since April 26th on the mound. Um, those three first-inning runs really killed the Zags, uh, but Oregon was held scoreless the next four uh, until – Zags Shea Kramer uh, ended his four-game hitless streak uh, with a three-run homer in the top of the eighth to give the Zags a lead, a slight margin of 4-3. Uh, but then Alec Gomez gave up a single that put – there's two ducks on the base, and Jacob Walsh for Oregon just um, hit a walk-off right down right field line. So a tough way to end it for the Zags, but they had a rebound – um quickly before a usd series they won game one eight to four gave hughes on the mound look just like gabe hughes has all year long um there's a four run spurt in that sixth inning that really just put the game out of reach uh it seems like oregon's pitcher just couldn't get out of a jam bases were loaded felt like the whole inning game two though it was a seven four loss for the zags with tristan reeling on the mound um this time it was usd that put up a six run spurt in the second inning. So with the series tied one to one, um, heading into that double header on Saturday, the third and final game, uh, the Zags 1 0 victory, just a slugfest, both pitchers dueling. Uh, William Kepner, Kepner was on the mound for the Zags. Uh, Cade McGee's single uh, in the third inning, I believe. Yeah, left, uh, brought in Tyler Rando to score. Zags had 10 hits. USD only had two, which is surprising for probably the top offense in the league. But yeah, Zags won the WCC regular season. And what were your sort of thoughts on that three-game series? Very interesting. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Um, it was, I mean, it was a battle like everybody kind of expected, and it really looked like that um, in all three games. There was no shortage of thrills and, you know, GU coming back and that that first game to win it and the second game and they were started up and I, I, I kind of was kind of playing. I remember I was watching the second game or following along and I saw and they had a two nothing lead. And I was kind of like, I was like, man, it kind of seems like whoever draws first blood is kind of actually like lose because it kind of gets the other team to smell it. And then they, the other team goes after. And that's sort of what happened is the Toreros went, went for the gut right after you put up a two spot. They put up, they proceeded to put up six. So, <laughs> you know, that's no, uh, that's that's tough to come back. That's tough to then bounce back and, and get that win after that for Gonzaga. But then they did bounce back the very next game, an hour later, uh, one nothing game. That's you know that's 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 how you really take a series and really you know kind of assert yourself as the as the better team is if you can win those close games that don't necessarily turn into a barn burner. And it's more of a pitching duel and a defensive battle. Gonzaga showed that, um, and it's great to see that they've won another WCC regular season title. Uh, it, the week in general, though, has gave me a little bit. I, I'm a little bit uh, nervous, though, I, I, I would say, for uh, going forward in the postseason. And maybe this is moving the goalposts a little bit, but now that we're kind of more used to Gonzaga winning, 
the WCC regular season title. And, and, you know, I'm really excited to see what they do in postseason play. You know, a regional is on the horizon. I think we can kind of lock them into a regional. And teams like Oregon, a team that we've lost to now twice this year already, those are the kind of teams we're going to be playing. Like, we're going to be playing in Oregon, in Oregon State. You know, those teams of those caliber. We've shown, Gonzaga has shown that they can beat those teams. But, you know, a, a close loss like that going right into the postseason – is one that kind of gives me a little bit of pause and, and worry. Um, not for any particular reason. The team looked good. It, 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 that's just two really good programs going at it. But still, um, a team like Oregon are the teams we're going to face in the regional if Gonzaga wants to get to a super regional. So, um, you know, it's just some things that gotta, they got to kind of iron out. But the USTC was, was a good proving point to be like, hey, no, we still got it. We're still that number one team. Don't forget about us. And nobody's going to forget about them come next week. Yeah, one thing we can always count on is the Zags, they, they battle. Um, you know, that that one against Oregon, that late game three-run shot from um, Shea, I mean, that was that, that was huge. Um, and, yeah, I, these these teams on the West Coast, the Oregon, the Oregon States, um, we, we took a couple against Oregon State earlier this year. Oregon kind of seems to be a kryptonite, but um, – it be interesting to see how they fare, yeah, against outside of the VCC play. And I think that goalpost now, like you mentioned, is certainly moving. Um, they're starting to trend towards that that lock every year to make the tournament out of the WCC. And so, yeah, we'll see how the conference tournament goes. That'll be from the 25th to the 28th. Uh, the Zags did clinch the one seed with that Friday victory over USD. And so they will have a first round bye, and they'll play the lowest remaining seed in the second round on the May 26th. It'll either be USF, who's the sixth seed, BYU, who is the four seed, and then LMU is that five seed. USD got the three seed, and Portland, based off an early season tiebreaker, um, will get that number two seed. They beat out. Uh, USD in three game series earlier this year came down to literally the final game of the series. Um, Oregon won, or not Oregon, uh, Portland won five to four uh, in extra innings against USD. So that sort of determined the two seed. Crazy, but yeah, interesting week coming up for the Zags. That tournament will be played in Stockton, California. Obviously, the winner is a guaranteed lock for the NCAA tournament. Um, as I mentioned, the matchup sort of USD will play USF and then BYU will play LMU, both those games on May 25th. If Gonzaga were to win their uh, matchup that 20, on May 26th, they'll advance the semifinal on Friday at 3.30. If not, they'll play in that loser bracket on Friday at noon. This is a double elimination tournament, so even one loss, the Zags or whoever, um, still have a chance to win it all. The WCC championship game is Saturday at 3 with game two, if necessary, later that day at 7 p.m. So definitely much a lot to keep an eye on. I'm pretty sure WCC sports is the only place you can probably watch those games. Mm -hmm. I doubt there's some, yeah, not nationally televised, but yeah, they're in a, the stadium streaming services, uh, love for sure on that one. You know, maybe, maybe, you know, I, I haven't checked the ESPN listings, but it, it might be there, might might creep into the ESPN three or seven or whatever. I mean, they got this point. Um, but no, I, it, I'm really curious for who they throw out for these games, you know. I mean, it's a lot can depend on that first game, but I'm I, I'm curious who they throw out in that first game, you know. I, I think it's going to come down to a matchup based thing, I think they're going to have both probably reeling and Hughes ready to go and tell them they, they might, you know, my back top might sit down and be like, Hey, look, yeah, you guys both got to keep your arms warm. We don't know who we're going to use on that first day. Um, yeah, I think it's going to come down to a matchup thing. And then, and then from there, it's just, okay, now, how do you, um, how do you, how do you win it? How do you, how do you clinch it from there? Maybe if, if, if they are able to win that first game. Um, but it's, you know, the Zags are definitely feared in this conference for their pitching. Um, their, their hitting is also like, you know, that lineup has also proved itself, proven itself, but I, I guarantee you well, those other teams, you know, whoever's playing Gonzaga after they win that first game is probably going to go to sleep with nightmares of, of, you know, Tristan Vreeling and Gabe, Gabe Hughes just pumping 97 in their, in their eyes. So, um, 
so yeah, it's it's gonna be fun for sure to see who uh, who gets thrown out there and and how they do it over there in Stockton. Um, and I'm excited for it, man. I I I want to I want to see Gonzaga, you know, really at its best going into uh, regional play. And this is the this is the best play, this is the best proving ground in the entire conference. So let's see it. Yeah, for sure. I think they will trot out probably Gabe. I would assume for that first game mm-hmm. at least. Um, I think that championship it'll be interesting if the Zags make it that far. Um, not a whole lot of rest. Uh, this late in the season, could we see, you know, Owen Wild step to the mound? He's been great all year. Um, I think Alec Gomez could probably get a nod in one of those games. Uh, not as a starter, maybe, but some, sort of as a reliever. But I think, yeah, it's been the backbone of the team this whole year is pitching. Uh, I don't think that's going to change, or it shouldn't change uh, come postseason. So, but we'll transition over now to the hardwood where mm-hmm. combine. <laughs> yes sir the draft combine the nba draft combine um sort of flies under the radar much like every other sports combine um you know it's basically dudes running around in shorts and tight clothes getting tested and measured and all sorts of stuff by scouts uh but the zags had four participants well we'll call them four chet holmgren didn't really did do a whole lot of participating in many of the drills or scrimmages, but Drew Timmy, Andrew Nembhard, and Julian Strother were all um, active participants, and they did they they showed out all three of them in different ways. Um, of course, this happened from the 18th to the 20th, and on those last two days was when we saw a lot of the drills and the scrimmaging. Um, Drew Timmy, as we all sort of expected, I think didn't really test athletically that great um he had the fifth the fifth best vertical for centers and fifth best three-quarter sprint for centers um i'm gonna put centers in air quote actually because we all know drew timmy's probably not gonna slide well into a center role but or that he doesn't profile as one i should say but yeah not the greatest athletic testing but i mean i think we both saw him in the scrimmage we know how dominant he can really be Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I, what, what was you know it was I think it was the epitome of what Drew Timmy is <laughs> is like you look at this dude and the way he measures and you know some of, some of his stats coming out of some of the shooting drills and things it's like not impressing you at all and you're like what like you're like you know maybe some of some people are thinking you should go back to call him see, see how that IL deal and then he gets on that and he gets in that court and, and you know you got rest of the whistles and all of a sudden the man is the biggest gamer out there and he's just a he's just a hooper man like he just goes yeah. and uh and he does his thing and 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 he also it was it was so great to see him the like from the jump his first game christens the basket with a three-pointer yeah and it's like oh shoot okay this is might be a little bit of a Drew Timmy different Drew Timmy we're talking about here but he still showed he still showed that he is just as just as pinpoint in you know his footwork and his his inside game and things of this nature. Um, it was really funny to see him, but impressive. I will say it's very impressive, but it was really funny to see him actually get, like start pressing dudes at the three point line and not waiting for them to get in the paint. Like he had to move a little bit and he talked about his post game. Like, Hey man, I had to work on my defense. I had to work on my three point shot. And I think I, sh- I think I showed those things and, and he definitely did. Oh, yeah. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm impressed with him for sure. He started off, you know, not in the strongest footing, but, um, you know, when you, when you go out there and th- there's no substitute for the game, you know, you can measure, you can measure up all the way to high heaven, but if, if, if you can't actually get up there and, and make the shots when it counts, uh, you know, you don't, you definitely don't have it for ready for the league. And he, he proved that he has that element going for him. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, you just talked about his three point shooting. Um, it was so funny to just watch him literally dominate, but in ways that you didn't see him do that at Gonzaga, mm-hmm. like, on offense, he's playing out there on the perimeter. He's not posting up on the low block. He's not taking up any space. Yeah. And I mean, he's making off ball cuts. He's running around. I mean, I've I haven't seen him run that fast or have to <laughs> make that, those kind of movements on offense in the half court in a while. Um, he did knock down a bunch of threes that second game. He had four. Uh, mm-hmm. he attempted five. Uh, he never had a game at Gonzaga where he attempted more than two in a game. So he definitely stretched his game. Um, he showed that he could play on the perimeter. 
Defensively, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done, I think. I think he held his own well against much athletic, much more athletic guys. Um, a little bit of a concern for me, though, was those turnovers. He did kind of rack them up. I, I felt like in transition, especially when he's trying to push the ball, um, he sort of wasn't on the same page with his guards. Um, he was decisive, but it just wasn't sometimes the right read. So that's something to kind of keep an eye on. And I'm sure that comes, like I said, with chemistry with other guards. But um, aside from Drew, who was great, and Andrew Nemhard had arguably the performance, uh, the best performance of any anyone at the Combine in that, uh, in that final day, in that second scrimmage, uh, 26 points, uh, 10 for 18 shooting, um, 11 assists, only two turnovers. That after not even doing really any, not much testing uh, those previous two days with an injury, but he definitely came on the court and like Drew just showed stuff that I, I hadn't seen him do at Gonzaga's from an aggressive standpoint. What about you? Yeah. Uh, Andrew Nemhar was one of the most impl- impressive. I, and maybe I'm, maybe I'm a WCC homer in this, but for me, the two most impressive players in the tournament, at the, everybody I watched was Andrew Nemhard and Jalen Williams. Mm-hmm. Like, they were those guys were just they were off the charts and 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 Nemhard, you know he, I, what I loved was he played, it, like he he played Andrew Nemhard so like it, it, I look like that's Andrew Nemhard, but he just turned it up to eleven it seemed like like yeah. as far as like his pace of play and his decision making like it was even quicker than it wasn't as maybe like methodical as it was at GU and I was a great thing to see from him because of all of those critics out there saying that he's too slow to play the position or he doesn't move his feet quick enough. And then he went out there and he ranked like top eight in like some of the agility drills, like, and like yep. out of the entire, out of the entire uh, combine. So that's like, you know, he's really just showing like, Hey, like you guys say all this crap about me. Like I'm going to prove you wrong right here, right here and now. And he did, and he did exactly what he had to do to raise his draft stock. I saw uh, some scouts say that it was someone named scout for somebody on Twitter um so how legit is it but like is he somebody was saying that he's like a top he's like a top 20 top 25 pick now and he was like before a mid-second um and i think whatever you know i was sitting there watching i was like man if he really goes the second late like he's going to win a heck of a lucky team because i don't necessarily necessarily think that he needs like the right exact fit i think i still think drew timmy and a guy like julian straw third if they were to go they would need like the right fit to like to succeed this in, to, in the NBA, Nemhard, I don't think it's necessarily the case. Like he can't. I don't think he would survive there being like a log jam of guards, but he would survive. I, I think he would. He would make it out of any almost any other kind of uh, uh, team uh, as that matter. So he's somebody I would really look for um, if I'm like a playoff team right now or a team that just got bounced in the playoffs. If you need to open up your guard room a little bit, bro, Andrew Nemhard, he's right there. I'm telling you, so good. Yeah, I, I think that, that the high at basketball IQ is the biggest thing, too. I mean, those 11 assists, he's playing with, I mean, really NBA-ready players, and that scrimmage showed that, you know, what he can do when playing, you know, alongside really, really talented players. I mean, he was hitting dudes on back cuts, uh, pick and roll, pretty much every read was the right one. And, yeah, I, I think a, a team picking late in the first round, you know, who – it's already a playoff team, we're already assuming. And so they can kind of take a, a chance on someone who's older, you know, compared to um, other prospects, but is can contribute still right away. And I think that's the biggest thing with him. So, and that was something too. I was, you know, I was going back and looking at his highlights, and it was kind of funny. I was picking out, like, when I was watching him, I'd look and be like, okay, that's a playoff scene to make in Gonzaga. That's not a playoff scene to make in Gonzaga. That's a playoff scene to make in Gonzaga. And even the ones that he made, like the ones that were like, oh, I've seen him make that kind of play at Gonzaga. It, it was just it was just a little bit quicker. And it was so he showed that 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 decision making that he has can work on the NBA, like on the NBA floor. Like he can be an NBA floor general. Um, and, you know, how valuable is that in a game like in like a game like today's game, like a great facilitator decision maker um, of, of his stature? That would be man. Um, and, and seeing, yeah, the way that he even worked with guys, and that's the one thing, because sometimes the NBA draft come on those scrimmages can get out of hand just because like everybody's trying to prove themselves and it's every man for himself sort of basketball. He, you know, you know, he was definitely going there to prove a point. Like he said, he was being a little bit selfish when they were talking to, to him after the post game. Cause he's like, it's, it's his time to shine. It is. 
But within that, like he showed that part of his natural mold is a dude who gets other guys involved in really dynamic ways and can understand, oh, hey, this guy's in the corner. He's a great corner three guy. So I'm going to drive, take up two dudes and dish it out. Like he was doing that. He was figuring out, okay, hey, like if I, if I take this lane on my, if I take this lane on my drive, I know I'm going to have this dude in my back pocket and I can feed somebody else a lob. Like these things, these, these kind of quick decision makings and just learn about your teammates that quick, that cerebral, that cerebral ability that he has. I, it's, it was really fun to watch. And I, I'm ready to see it on the NBA floor and I hope uh, NBA teams are too. Yeah. Hopefully one team picking in that, in that twenties range who is established uh, as a winner, has a great culture. Um, Andy would fit right in. And I, that's that Saturday scrimmage showed that he can play pretty much with anyone. Um, that third final zag that participated in most of the drills um, although did not participate in any scrimmages, was Julian Strother. He did um, have the best lane agility uh, of anyone at the combine at 10.3 seconds, which I watched it look much faster, but, you know, whatever. And uh, he also had the uh, third best college corner left shot from the non-stationary, I believe, uh, drills. And then he made 70% of his off-dribble break left shot. So, he shot the ball really well, which we saw him do at Gonzaga. Um, that athleticism, I, something that honestly caught me off a little bit that was surprising to see from him, but good on him. It'll be interesting to see sort of his projections uh, over the next coming weeks. Um, he didn't participate in those scrimmages. So maybe I, I remember hearing, you know, maybe he's sitting it out just because he already knows what his decision is going to be. And he kind of just used that as, you know, a way to gauge, he used the testing um, as a way to gauge where he's at in comparison to other NBA ready players. I think that's a legitimate, you know, avenue to go down. I remember Bill Self was on there and he was talking about encouraging players to just gauge. And I think um, Julian Strother did that. So, but we'll see from him. Uh, either way, his future is bright. And I think the combine was just a glimpse of what he'll be next year, whether it's at Gonzaga or in the NBA. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think at this point it's, it's unclear what his decision is, but I'm pretty sure he's made that decision already. Um, you know, I, I, I think I would, I, you know, if, if I'm a scout, you know, for me, some of the concerns for, for a guy like Strawford is in how he plays and just be able, you know, like his, his measurements and, you know, how he shoots and, you know, you know, with nobody in his face is that, that that's great. I know he has that in his pocket, but I would have loved to have seen like, Hey, what do you do when it comes to game time? You know, are, you know, are you like the opposite of Drew Timmy? Or are you somebody who can also measure well and then go out there and play? Um, you know, and, and the kids are Hooper. I'm not, I'm not saying he's not, he definitely is. It's just, I would have liked to see that if I'm trying to, if I'm trying to draft a kid like him. Um, Cause yeah, he measures so well, teams are definitely licking their lips at those numbers. Um, but you know we, we we'll just have to wait and see. Um, but yeah, he I mean you no, know, he looked so strong when he was out there and doing those drills. Um, you, you, he's quick, man. He's a he's a fast player, and uh, I, I love that the Gonzaga guys are are getting their nods for being you know really really solid athletes, when, especially in a really athletic draft like this year's. Yeah, yeah, this is definitely I basketball. We say is positionless, and this is this is the wave now because we're seeing centers that don't move like centers anymore. We're seeing guards that are four inches above, you know, the average height and it, it's a mess, but I, I'm here for it. Um, and yeah, we'll keep an eye on that going forward. The draft is June 23rd, I believe. So a little ways out um, and we'll surely get more information by then. June 1st is the deadline for players to decide whether they're still going to remain in the draft or go back to school or transfer that is as well. So, yeah, one week, one week. So next week when we, when we convene, we'll, we'll kind of maybe have a lot of the, a lot of the cards will be in place by then. I think. Yeah. I'm sure there'll be guys who make their decision by then and we can do more speculating because why not? Yeah. I think that does it for this episode, Asher. We, we covered mm -hmm. all the bases of Gonzaga sports. Um, so yeah. Just give it a little break here for a second. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was about 20 minutes right there. 20, 23 minutes, actually. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, we'll, we'll just kind of bring this back home, and then, we'll, and then we'll be wrapped up on that. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm just going to do another. All right.
that'll do it all for episode number four of the Bulldog Alley podcast. Once again, I am your co-host, Cole Forsman, joined by I'm Asher Ali. What's up? <laughs> Peace out. Thank you guys for listening. Go follow Gonzaga Nation on all platforms. And until next week.